Imagine two different worlds, right? Imagine a world in which the same person who has the same abilities and resources and everything else. In one world, you can imagine the transit agency sets a price at $1.50 uh, for them to ride the bus. And you can imagine another world where everything else is the same for them except for the transit agency sets that price to zero. How would that change their life? What would be different about how they interact with trans, not just public transit, but in terms of how they travel around, how they get around, what they do in their life, where they work, where they live, uh, where they go to see the doctor, what grocery store they go to, whether they go to the park with their kids, all of those things, to what extent do those change in one world versus the other. My name is David Phillips. I am a research professor of economics at the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities uh, in the economics department at the University of Notre Dame. There's a, um, a long history of people interested in the topic of what we call spatial mismatch. And so interested in the idea that right jobs are in one location, uh, people uh, who might want to work in those jobs might be in a different location. And there might be disparities in, in that by income, by race, et cetera, uh, on who has access to jobs. And we might think that some of the inequity that we see in our world might be the result of just can people get to, could be jobs, could be other things, the things that they might have reason to want to be able to access. Amenities are, are really rich in some communities and are less available in other communities. Uh, and so when we think about mobility and, and transit in particular, we're thinking, okay, could we help people have better access um, to those different amenities, to jobs and, and so on? Um, and, and so when I think about mobility, uh, I, I'm interested in that. Can people have uh, similar access um, to these, these different options in the world? When economists think about public transportation, usually we're thinking uh, about forms of transportation uh, that are operated um, by uh, public or quasi-public entities and often are forms of mass transportation that lots of people share. So think of things like taking the bus, uh, taking a subway system or things like that. In recent years, right, you've seen some expansion into sort of things that are on the edge of that where you've got public agencies that uh, say uh, publicly subsidize ride sharing or things like that. But traditionally, right, we're mostly thinking about bus, light rail, some places ferries. Yeah, we operated our study in King County, Washington, which is the, the county that includes Seattle as its main city. Um, and, and we chose that city for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that I think there was a great partnership with the local government there. There's a transit agency there, um, King County Metro, who was a wonderful partner uh, and was innovative in thinking about questions about how they should think about tra uh, pricing transit, and particularly for people with low income. And so I think part of it was there, there were really relevant policy questions for them that they wanted to answer, and they wanted to partner with researchers to try to understand them. But I also think it's a place that's of, of interest uh, more broadly for other people who are thinking about these questions for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it has the type of geographic disparities that you see in lots of different metro areas across the United States, right? So you have some places where um, there's lots of access to good job opportunities and others less so. Uh, and places that have less access to job opportunities tend to be places where uh, more people with low income are more likely to live, right? So you have that pattern go happening in King County, which is similar to other places in the United States, which makes it a place where I think this, this question of whether transportation can connect people to opportunity is relevant. A second piece is that their transit system looks a lot like most communities in the United States. I think a lot of people hear public transit and they think maybe like New York City and the subway. And, and there, it's true that there's a, there's a small handful of, of cities in the United States where transit is primarily rail, um, but that's not the majority, right? Most, most even large cities in the United States Right, transit is mostly bus, and particularly for people with low income. And the transit infrastructure in, in, in King County, Washington, it's pretty widely varying. There's buses, there's ferries, there's lots of different stuff because of the geography, uh, but most of it is bus. Uh, and, and so I think that fits with what's relevant in most places, at least around the United States. And so when we're thinking about the effect uh, of uh, transit pricing on people's mobility, what I mean by effect there is, is imagine two different worlds, right? Imagine a world in which the same person who has the same abilities and resources and everything else. In one world, you can imagine the transit agency sets a price at $1.50 uh, for them to ride the bus. And you can imagine another world where everything else is the same for them except for the transit agency sets that price to zero. How would that change their life? What would be different about how they interact with trans, not just public transit, but in terms of how they travel around, how they get around, what they do in their life, where they work, where they live, uh, where they go to see the doctor, what grocery store they go to, whether they go to the park with their kids, all of those things, to what extent do those change in one world versus the other. That's what I mean by, by effect. And what we find is that people ride transit about twice as much when they, have, uh, at, when they don't have to pay uh, to get on the bus, to get on the train, and, and, and so on. And so that's all of these trips for all sorts of different things, right? That's going to work, that's taking your kids to daycare, that's that all, all of these different things. You add up all of those trips for somebody's day, people are taking about twice as many of those trips. And so in, in practical terms, what does that mean? That means you know uh, people are able to go more places uh, or they're able to shift uh, some of those trips from another mode, right? That could be uh, a trip that they would have had to walk or that they would have uh, needed to drive a car. 
uh, or get a, more likely get a ride with you know a family member friend who has access to a car, and instead they can take they, they can take transit. We focused in this study uh, on people with low income, and in particular we were focused on on people who are receiving public benefits. In general, that's going to be all people who have, are with income below 200% of the federal poverty line uh, are gonna be the people who are in our study. Think of that for a family of four as something uh, like $40,000 a year or less. When people uh, who have income, say $40,000 a year or less, are having get free access uh, to public transit as opposed to paying $1.50, uh, they're riding public transit about twice as much. For me, I, I get really excited and passionate about um, issues related to public transportation, particularly public transportation for, uh, and, and how it affects the lives of people with less income, because it's, it really hits you in the face uh, how important it is in the day-to-day -day decisions that people make in their lives. Um, so in the work that I do, so I work with the Lab for Economic Opportunities at Notre Dame. In our work, we interact with a lot of social service provider partners, so organizations who work with folks with low income, or folks who, uh, who are experiencing homelessness and so on. And when you look at the day-to-day -day decisions that people are making and what these and the social service providers that are trying to work with folks in their situations, you, you look and you say, okay, what are they trying to manage? Transportation is really high near the top of the list. People are constantly trying to figure out, if it's in a place with good public transit, they're tr constantly trying to figure out, how do I pay for the bus? Does it go where I, I'm trying to go? Is this job that I'm trying to get, does it have access to, you know, does the bus have access to it? And, you know, does the bus line run nearby? People are constantly... Um, thinking about transportation. In a place without public transit, people are thinking, can I get a ride there? Can I figure out some way uh, that can, can my cousin take me to the job interview, et cetera? Um, it, transportation really looms large in people's lives. If, if you want sort of one fact that I think summarizes it, if you go to just like general uh, expenditure data, so go to like the US Consumer Expenditure Survey and look up what people spend their own money. If you look at people in the bottom uh, income quintile, the second highest category that people spend money on is transportation. It's behind only housing. I think a lot of people would be surprised that, that, that transportation comes ahead of a lot of other stuff. It comes ahead uh, of, of food and other necessities. We have a lot of other public assistance programs, right, that that provide more general support to something like food, for instance. We don't, we don't really do that so much for housing. We don't really do that so much for transportation. And so as a result, it, it sort of comes out. Uh, and when people are thinking about how do I spend out of pocket, like transportation is really high on what people are trying to juggle. I mean, I think it, so. The yeah, I think there is a question that a lot of people ask yeah, about whether the United States, just geographically, is too big for public transportation. Um, there, there is some truth to that, right? I mean, there's just more space in a lot of U.S. cities um, than there is in some other places that have higher concentration, where you know, larger proportion of people use public transit. Now, some of that is potentially right a response of people to public transit, right? When you set up infrastructure in a particular way, people decide where they're going to live in response to that. And so, right, our cities are bigger, yes, which makes public transit more difficult. Part of that also is a response to the fact that we have poor public transit, right? If you, uh, you know, we're, we're in Texas right now, right? You look at a lot of cities in Texas, right? You have, you know, really good road infrastructure, right? And people respond to that, right? And so they buy cars and they live further on the suburbs and so on. And so um, there is a way in which these things feed off each other, right? You get in an equilibrium where, um, if you have better public transit, that affects where people live, that might affect the density of a city, and that it makes tr you know, public transit more feasible. So it is the case, I think, that in the U.S. we are in a situation where public transit is more difficult because of the history that we have with it. Right? It's harder to break out of that, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But it, it, does, it is true, I think, that it's, it, it's, it's hard to shake that equilibrium that, that we find ourselves in. So th this project um, was a partnership that came out of the Lab for Economic Opportunities, or LEO, where I work at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and so what LEO does is it works with uh, service providers around the country, so nonprofit organizations, local governments, and so on. Like in this project, uh, we partner with them to learn about what, uh, what makes the biggest difference um, in the lives of, of people facing poverty in the United States, whether that be something related to housing, education, or, or transportation, like we're talking about here, or, or other areas. And so we work with those different organizations to build research projects to try to measure the effectiveness of what they're doing. In this case, right, we're looking to see, okay, how much of a difference does it make when county government in, in Seattle and King County can, can provide free public transportation. In other situations, um, we look at, at other interventions and help those organizations both learn about what's working best in their community so that then not only they can use that information, but other communities can also learn uh, about what makes the biggest difference, what's going to be most effective um, in, in responding and, and providing real uh, assistance to folks in, in situations of poverty. One thing about this project that I think is important to keep in mind are, are sort of the policy trade-offs that transit agencies are are 
are working with. Making transit free is, is an expensive proposition for them, right? So then they have to think about, okay, we either need to raise that revenue from somewhere, right? And, and maybe a community looks at its transit infrastructure and says, okay, we're going to invest in this uh, by reducing fares to try to encourage ridership, to try to get out of this equilibrium where you have low ridership and a, a transit network that doesn't meet what you want. And let, let's get broader ridership. Yeah get economies of scale and make this thing work really well. Or there becomes a trade-off, I think what transit agencies worry about is that people will want us to advocate for, let's make transit free but not do anything else. So if you make transit free and you don't do anything else, then transit agency with a fixed budget, what do they have to do? They have to cut service quality, right? Because now they have less revenue coming in. If you have a fixed budget and you reduce fares, then all of a sudden you're running the buses less often. So I think when we think about um, sort of from a policy point of view, what would you, how do you want to think about fair policy in the United States? You want to think about that trade-off. You want to think about, okay, if we're going to do this, how are we going to invest to make that possible? Or w what is the trade-off that we're willing to make in terms of price versus quality in transit? Because it, it's something, ha you know, you can sort of three legs of the stool in some sense, right? There's, there's, there's fares, um, there's the quality of the system. Um, and there's the budget that's provided the agency. And if you move one of them, it affects how the other two operate as well.